from the fire of God in Jesus' name. And we give you praise and glory for it, Father. We give you honor for it tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, if you're in agreement tonight, just give the Lord praise right where you're at. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, turn to the person next to you tonight and say, you look better than you think you do. Amen. And you can be seated. Hallelujah. If you didn't think you looked good, you actually do. And if you already thought you looked good, you look better than you thought you did. Amen. Somebody says, why is that? Because the Bible says his presence beautifies his people. You're not just beautiful, you're beautified. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, tonight, by the leading of the Holy Ghost... I start a new series on the anointing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, you've probably heard that phrase before if you've been in church and had no idea what that meant. You probably thought we said the ointment. <laughs> but it's not the ointment. It's the anointing. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we're going to get into what the anointing is. And in fact, the full name of this series is the seven primary functions of the anointing. The seven primary functions of the anointing. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And then, um, but before we get into the word tonight. Well, yeah, Lord, I'll go ahead and say that. And then uh, this Sunday, I'm starting a series on the fire of God. So I know it's an outreach. I've never preached the fire from an evangelistic standpoint, but I guess God's got something in mind. Somebody says, you don't know what you're going to preach on Sunday? Nope. <laughs> but I'm going to follow the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to see souls come into the kingdom of God this Sunday. Amen. Amen. Our back to school outreach, but we're going to see this altar filled and flooded with people. Hallelujah. Yeah. How many know we're a soul winning church? Yeah. Amen. It's all about souls. If we're not bringing souls into the kingdom of God, we're wasting our time. Amen. Amen. I did not come all the way from Florida to California just to put butts in seats. Amen. Amen. I came all the way from Florida to California to set hearts on fire Amen. with the Holy Ghost. And normally on Wednesdays, I try to wear some sort of button shirt even if it's a short sleeve one. But tonight I decided to wear this shirt, which I got at Tampa last week. Because on the back of this shirt is the cry of my heart, which says, Lord, dip me in the kerosene of thy spirit and set my heart ablaze that I may burn for you. <laughs> That's all I want. Hallelujah. I feel the anointing already. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Don't get nervous. When the Holy Ghost shows up, things are a little different, but it's a good different. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We just got back from Youth Week, and I'll tell you... <laughs> I'll tell you, the fire of God rocked our young people to their very core. Amen. I know there's a lot of people that think we've lost this generation. I'll tell you, the only people that lost this generation are the religious. But I'll tell you, who has got this generation is the Holy Ghost. I just watched for six days straight the anointing of the Holy Ghost flood 2,000 young people from the tops of their heads to the soles of their feet, people who have never experienced the anointing before, standing at altars, weeping uncontrollably under the presence of God. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you one thing about the presence of God is it is new every time you experience it. It's fresh every time. So you never get into the presence of God and go, oh, 
Here we go again. <laughs> Amen. I don't know, you could, you could mention your favorite movie, and at some point, if you watched it enough, you wouldn't want to watch it anymore. You could mention your favorite restaurant, and at some point, if you kept going, eventually you're going to not want to go anymore, at least for a little bit. But when you get touched by the anointing, all you want is the anointing. You can't get enough of it. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 4. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that said unto you, give me drink, you would have asked of me and I would have given you living water that you would never thirst again. Can you say amen? Yeah. Now the Bible compares the presence of God to wine. So if you wonder why people behave the way they do when the power of God enters into a room, one of the terminologies people use is drunk. People act drunk. Why is that? Because the presence of God fills them. They get inebriated with the presence of God. Amen. And so, but we understand this, Holy Ghost people, we understand this, that the new wine of the Holy Ghost is better than the wine of the world. Amen. And so people in the world, when they're having a tough time, when they're needing relief, they go get a drink from the world. But Holy Ghost people, in the presence of Jehovah... In the presence of Jehovah, hallelujah, you just take a drink of the new wine and everything turns out fine. Amen. There was a, uh, there was a, a revival in the region of the United Kingdom called Welsh. It was the Welsh revival of the early 1900s. And the presence of God swept over that region. Lives were touched and changed. Hundreds of thousands of people came to the Lord. And during that period of time, there was a, a, a motto or a phrase, a little poem, if you will, an ode that came out from that revival that was written by the Christians at that time. And uh, it, it, it grew in popularity until it almost became, you know, a way of life for them. And, and the phrase went like this, the darkened world around me, sage, thinks I'm mad or drunk with rage, drunken, yes, I'm drunk and odd but drunken with the wine of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and, so, and so I've found out, hallelujah, that it doesn't matter what period of time Holy Ghost people come from, we're all of kindred spirit. Amen. Yeah. That, that poem was written in 1904, and it applies to me in 2022. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Because the presence of God doesn't have an expiration date on it. Amen. Some of you might have noticed this, that... You can talk about times that the presence of God has come on you, and when you begin to talk about it, the pre same presence comes on you again. I can't tell my testimony about when the fire of God came on me January 10th, 2009, without that same fire coming on me again. I can't tell my testimony about when I was 12 years old and went to a Rodney Howard Brown meeting and got hit with the glory of God without that glory coming on me again. It happens to me every, every time. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you why, my, 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 my dean in Bible school put it this way, your spirit never forgets an atmosphere. So when you begin to talk about it, it's like your spirit is transported, it's, it's, it's like you go right back to that moment, right back to that time, amen, hallelujah. Now there was a great revivalist by the name of Charles Finney, somebody says, when is he going to start preaching? Now, I'm preaching right now. There was a great revivalist by the name of Charles Finney who God used him in a great revival here in America that we call the Second Great Awakening. The First Great Awakening was headed mostly by a man named George Whitfield, Second Great Awakening in the 1700s. And the Second Great Awakening was headed mostly by Charles Finney, although there were other ministers that God used as well. But Charles Finney said this, he said, when people would claim that they were touched by the presence of God in my services, he said, I would call them up to testify about it. And he said, not because I wanted to hear the story of what happened. He said, I wanted to see how deep the touch was. And he said, this is how I knew if the touch was deep or not. He said, if they could tell the story of what happened without being moved by it, I knew the touch wasn't that deep. But he said, if the testimony brought them joy unspeakable, then I knew it was full of glory. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And so my pastor has brought me up in front of the, the church many times in Florida to tell about when I got touched when I was 12 years old. 
And no matter how many times he's brought me up there, no one still has heard the story. Because every time I get brought up, that same glory comes on me. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so what I need you to understand tonight is that as we dive into the subject of the anointing, we're not getting into something that is going to produce head knowledge. This is not about us filling your noggin with information. Amen. Amen. But the Bible says that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them for they are spiritually discerned. And so that's why people don't understand when the Holy Ghost comes in a room and people begin to fall out of their chair and weep and laugh uncontrollably and shake under the power of God. They don't understand it because the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Amen. If you've ever heard my pastor preach, he'll say things like, why did they fall down? Because they can't stand up. Why are they laughing? Because they're happy. Amen. And somebody says, well, why doesn't he give a more theological explanation? Because even if he did, the person trying to understand it, they still wouldn't get it. Because you don't receive the things of God with your head. You receive the things of God with your spirit. Now, don't get me wrong. Your head is important. <laughs> Amen. You need your head. Your head tells you when to wake up in the morning. Your head reminds you to brush your teeth. Thank God. Amen. <laughs> but how many in here, your head at one time or another has let you down? Yes. Amen. So I wouldn't depend on my head too much if I were you. Heads are for thinking. Hearts are for drinking. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. And so most people, they have difficulty receiving from the Spirit of God because they're all up here. But if he were a God that could be grasped mentally, then he's too small of a God. Can you say amen? But the Bible says this about God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Bible says that the foolishness of God is wiser than the highest wisdom of man. I like to put that same statement, I like to put it this way. God's ABCs are higher than any man's PhDs. Can you say Amen. The highest, the most intelligent person on earth, they can't even touch God's basics. Amen. Hallelujah. And so there's no point in trying to comprehend God. Now, don't get me wrong. The longer you walk with God, you will come to an understanding of some things. But I promise you, on this side of eternity, you will never reach the full understanding of who God is. Amen. But it's fun trying. Yeah. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't care how many times you've read the pages of this book, I guarantee you there's a whole lot of stuff you missed. Amen. I've read this Bible through at least eight times, and portions of it way more than that. Way more than that. And there's still a whole lot in here I don't know. Amen. Hallelujah. I know I've read the New Testament over 60 times. And again, portions of it more than that. Amen. Hallelujah. And there's still a whole lot in there that I don't know. Amen. And so it's not about grasping God with your intellect, because your intellect is finite. Amen. Even in your realm of expertise, whatever your career is or whatever area you may have studied a lot in, whatever you think you know a lot about, I guarantee you there's still information you don't know in that realm. How much more the infinite God. Amen. And so he can't be grasped with the natural mind. The things of God are grasped with the spirit. Can you say amen? But the word of God, now, now here's the danger. Yes, the things of God are grasped with your spirit. But how many understand there are good spirits and there are bad spirits? Amen. Amen. And what's happened in a lot of cases is people who have learned how to bypass their natural intellect and get into their spirit, in a lot of cases, although that's good, what's happened is they have no anchor in the realm of the spirit, and so they get off into things they know nothing about and can't tell the difference between the Holy Ghost or another spirit. Amen. 
And so it's the Word of God. As we begin to dive into the realm of the Spirit, as we begin to walk in the things of the Spirit, as we begin to experience the things of the Spirit, it's the Word of God that anchors us. Can you say amen? It's the Word of God that founds us, and so we don't get off over into strange or weird doctrines. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so let me say this tonight. The anointing may cause things to happen in a service that people are not necessarily used to, but if it's the Holy Ghost, what's happening in the service can be found in the Word. What doesn't make any sense to me is when people want to move on beyond the Word. You haven't even experienced everything that's in here. Why are you trying to move on past it? Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Have you seen the Red Sea split yet? Then you haven't experienced everything. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Have you climbed to the top of a mountain that is thundering with darkness and lightning? Hallelujah. And lived for 40 days in the presence of God till you come back down the mountain with your face shining so bright that people have to put a veil over you because they can't look you in the face. If that hasn't happened, you haven't experienced everything. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we use the word of God to anchor us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We use the word of God to anchor us. And I'll give you an example. The Bible says in Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19, that God began to work unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. And somebody says, well, see right there, pastor, there's unusual miracles there. Yeah, it was an unusual miracle, but it wasn't unscriptural. What was the unusual miracle that God worked? The Bible says handkerchiefs and aprons were taken from off of Paul's body and laid upon the sick and the demonized and whoever they were laid upon, the, just the, the contact of that garment that was on Paul's body set free the demonized or healed the sick. But that's not unscriptural. We can find that in the scripture. How many remember the woman with the issue of blood? What did she touch to be healed? The hem of his garment. Amen. And so even though God worked unusual miracles through the hands of Paul, you could still find that unusual miracle in the pages of the scripture. So what do we say to that then? There is a scriptural law of interpretation called the mouth of two or three witnesses. The mouth of two or three witnesses. And what that biblical biblical law does for us is it protects us from just turning to some random page in the Bible, reading something, and turning a doctrine out of it. Because you turn to one page, and it says, Judas went and hung himself. And then you turn to another page, and it says, Go thou and do likewise. (laughs) Well, God told me to hang myself. No. You're a dummy. Bless your precious heart and stupid head. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so what the, what, the, uh, what the law of interpretation of the mouth of two or three witnesses does is it causes us to make sure that whatever we grasp from the Scripture, it is confirmed somewhere else in the Scripture. Because here's the amazing thing about this book. The first word that was penned chronologically that was put into this book until the last word that was penned chronologically put into this book. Which, by the way, even though the book of Genesis talks about the beginning, that's not the oldest book of the Bible. Did you know that? Job is the oldest book of the Bible. Anybody know that? Well, now you do. The last book of the Bible that was written was 2 Timothy, chronologically. So even though Revelation is the last book of the Bible, you know, when it comes to the index... As far as when the books were written, Job was the first book of the Bible that was written, and 2 Timothy was the last book of the Bible that was written. And over the course from the time that the first word in the book of Job was written until the last word of the book of 2 Timothy was written, it took over 3,000 years to write all of those pages. There are over 40 authors over the course of the 66 different books of this Bible. And over the course of 3,000 years and over 40 authors, not one word of this book contradicts any other part of the book. It is in perfect agreement. It's in perfect unity. That's supernatural. 
Can you say amen? Man, you can't even watch a TV show without seeing a contradiction over the course of three, three seasons. It's like, hey, wait a minute. In season two, they said this. Now they're saying this in season three. But the Bible has no contradictions whatsoever. Can you say amen? And so the Bible says of itself in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says all scripture. How much scripture? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be perfected, thoroughly furnished, or thoroughly prepared for every good work. Every good work that God has called you to complete here on the earth, the Bible has the information and has the revelation necessary for you to carry that out. Can you say amen? So he says, Pastor, I want a word. Here's 36,000 of them. Amen. Read them all. Amen. Pastor, I want to hear God speak. Read your Bible out loud. Amen. Don't get me wrong. I believe that God speaks to people today. But you need to understand this. There's a whole lot of voices. And the only way you can become familiar with the voice of the Spirit of God is if you find out what the Spirit of God already said. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I got my daddy sitting back there. And I'm so familiar with my dad that it doesn't matter how large of a crowd we're in. If I hear Wes Weber laugh, I know it's Wes Weber. Amen. That's my daddy. It's actually happened before. We're in like some crowded area. And I'll be, you know, with my friends or whatever. I'm not even next to my dad. But over in the distance, I hear my dad laughing. Oh, that's my dad. Amen. And so there are, the Bible says, there are many voices in the world and none are without signification. In other words, every voice has a significance. But the problem is, with all these voices, we can lose sight or we can lose the, uh, the, 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 the recognition of the voice of the Spirit of God. And so it's the Word of God that permits us, amen, to stay familiar with the voice of the Spirit of God. Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. And so with that being said, we're going to get into the Word tonight, starting this new series on the anointing. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, please. The book of Isaiah, chapter 61. The book of Isaiah, chapter 61. Hallelujah. Amen. Isaiah, chapter 61. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 61, and we're going to start in verse 1. Say amen when you're there. Amen. Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1. The Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Why? Because the Lord has anointed me to. Everybody say to. So this is what you need to understand tonight. The anointing is for a purpose. Now, this is where a lot of people get themselves in trouble. The anointing is not a feeling. The anointing has a feeling. You can feel the anointing, but that's not what the anointing is. I'll, I'll make a comparison. Steak is not a flavor. Steak has a flavor. If you eat steak, it's a very distinct flavor. You know you're eating steak. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for all the vegans. Leaves more steak for me. Amen. Amen. But steak is not a flavor. It has a flavor, but it is not a flavor. The anointing is not a feeling. It has a feeling, but that is not what it is. And you can be in the presence of the anointing, and the anointing be doing a work in your life, and you feel nothing. Now, when I understood that, that set me free. And it set me free in a very powerful way, because when I first got to Bible school, my heart was very hard because of sin that I had engaged in. And the Lord was having to set me free from various bondages. 
So I would be in services and then thank God for the move of God, thank God for the touch of the anointing, thank God for the feeling of the anointing, but I would be in services where it seemed like everybody was getting touched but me. Person in front of me is getting touched, person behind me is getting touched, to the left of me, to the right of me, and I'm like, God, you missed a spot. <laughs> Amen. And, and so out of my frustration, I didn't know what I was supposed to do to receive from the anointing. So I did the only thing I knew how to do. I'd watched enough TV shows to know you make a deal with him. By the way, that's not what you do. But I thought that's what you did. So I'd be in my seat, and I'm like, God, if you touch me tonight, I promise I won't do that thing anymore. And if, if you touch me tonight, I promise I'll go win ten souls, Lord. And, if you, and I'm making all these, all these deals with God in my seat, and nothing ever happened. And so what would happen is, the enemy came to me with the same two lies that he has come to every person who wants to get touched but isn't getting touched. Same two lies. Number one, that God doesn't want to touch me. That's a lie. God wants to change your life. Yes. Amen. Amen. And when he changes your life, he's going to do it by the anointing. Amen. Amen. Number one, the lie he told me was that God doesn't want to touch me. And number two, the lie he told me is that what I was seeing was fake. He tells everybody the same lies. My wife tells the testimony that when she first went to a Rodney Howard Brown meeting and she saw everybody laughed and everything, she said out loud, this is fake. But thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Curiosity killed the cat, <laughs> but, it, but it saved the saint. <laughs> Can you say amen? So she said out loud, this is fake. But on the inside, there was just one small question. But what if it's real? What if it's real? But what if it's real? Amen. And I don't know how many meetings she went to. But finally, she was in one meeting in Lakeland, Florida. My pastor was preaching again. And all of a sudden, the fire of God fell on her in that service. And from the top of her head to the soles of her feet, she was consumed in the power of God. You Listen, if you know my sweetheart, you know she's a very reserved person. She's adorable, but she is not going to cause any scene. She's not going to cause any issues. I will. <laughs> Happily. <laughs> without regard for anybody else. But my sweetheart is not that way. It's not that funny. <laughs> but she tells a testimony that when the fire of God hit her, she was bouncing up and down in her seat. She was screaming. She was laughing uncontrollably. She says, oh, you couldn't pay me to act like that. When the Holy Ghost comes on you, you'll do it for free. Yeah. And let me tell you something. The power of God is so real, you won't even care what you looked like later. Somebody say, you looked like a fool, and all you'll tell them is, if you knew, if you knew what happened to me, if you knew what happened to me, can you say amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. My wife was, she had been in Bible school for how many months before? She was in, she was in Bible school for two months. The power of God's moving already. She was in Bible school for two months before she got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And the day she got baptized in the Holy Ghost, my pastor was showing a video of a mass crusade that he did in Africa. And as she was watching that crowd of people, the sea of people, too great to number, I believe there were 400,000 people in that crusade. She's watching this and she's weeping. She sees this happen in my... Power of God sweeping over the class, and when that video ends, my pastor just starts saying fire, and the fire of God hits the class. And my wife tells, now this is before I ever met her, and my wife says the next thing she knows, she's come, she, she comes to, she's on the floor. She was in her seat, now she's on the floor. 
You can't be a germaphobe and be a Holy Ghost Christian. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. That'll be one of the first things you get set free from. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's why Pentecostals weren't afraid of COVID. I mean, we had, we already got spit and snot flying everywhere all the time. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Pentecostals believe that if a mosquito bites them, he'll fly away singing, the blood still works. <laughs> Amen. So she, wa she wakes up off of the floor, and she he first she didn't know who it was, and then she realized it was her. She heard herself saying, santo, santo, santo. Now, she's Puerto Rican, but she doesn't know a lick of Spanish. <laughs> I'm Mexican, and I don't know a lick of Spanish. So I try to put an accent on my voice when I order Mexican food. Enchilada. Taco. That's all Spanish I know. Jarito. Horchata. That's it. That's the best I got right there. So she, she comes up... She doesn't know any either. So she comes up off the floor and she hears herself saying, Santo, Santo. And it was only later she found out she was saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. She got baptized in the Holy Ghost right then and there. Amen. Hallelujah. Now what did that? Because my pastor was saying fire, but he didn't come over and lay hands on her. He didn't sit with her for 30 minutes and teach her about the baptism in the Holy Ghost. She actually, I believe, had gone up several times to receive it. Nothing happened. But when the anointing came in the room, when the anointing came in the room, and here's, here's one thing the anointing does. The anointing takes what was difficult in the flesh and it makes it easy. Amen. Amen. The anointing takes what was difficult in the flesh, and it makes it easy. That's why Jesus said, my yoke is... How could Jesus say, my yoke is easy? He, he was about to take on the sin of the whole world. Even the cross itself that he carried was over 200 pounds, and after being whipped 39 times... With a cat of nine tails, his body literally torn open by shards of glass, beaten with rods, a, a, a crown of thorns hammered onto his brow. He had to carry that 200-pound cross up a hill. But he said, my yoke is easy. And that's why Hebrews chapter 12 says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody says, but pastor, don't you know that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was so stressed out that he was sweating great drops of blood? Yeah. But then when he surrendered to the Father and said, not my will, but thine be done, the Bible says an angel came and ministered strength to him. Amen. How many think you could do extra stuff if an angel came and ministered strength to you? Amen. And so when Peter cut off the ear of Malchus the nephew of the high priest, and Jesus picks the ear back up and just puts it back on as if nothing ever happened. He then tells Peter, he says, put away your sword, for don't you know that even now I could pray to my father and he would provide me with 12 legions of angels. Now a legion is a word that stems from the Roman military strength and it refers to anywhere from three to 6,000 soldiers. And Jesus said his father would provide him with 12 legions of angels. That means at minimum 36,000 angels. To put that into perspective, in Isaiah 37, one angel killed 140,000 men by himself. What do you think 36,000 angels would do? So Jesus was saying, if I wanted to, I could pray that right now. But, he said, shall I not drink from the cup 
that my Father has given me. So here's what the anointing does. The anointing shows you what God has ahead of you. And if you pursue it in the flesh, it's far too difficult. How is little old me that nobody's ever heard of? How is God going to send me from temp? Don't you think he should have sent some big name minister to come shake the Inland Empire? Don't you think he should send some, somebody with way more resources? Don't you think he should have sent Daniel Kalenda over here who's had mass crusades all over the world? Don't you think he should have sent Rodney Howard Brown over here who's, whose ministry has touched 80 nations of the earth? But he sends little old me over here. And he says, go shake the Inland Empire. And whenever I look at the assignment in the flesh, I say, how is that going to happen? But then I get over into the anointing. And I say, God's going to shake the Inland Empire. Can you say amen? Amen. And so one thing the anointing does is it takes the assignment that God's placed on your life that looks far too difficult in the flesh. And all of a sudden, it looks easy. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Have we read Isaiah yet? We stopped at two, didn't we? So the anointing. See, never close your Bible when I'm preaching because I'm going to get back to it. (laughs) The anointing is for a purpose. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me too. Somebody says, I have a great anointing on my life. For what? Because if you can't tell me for what, it's a waste. God is into abundance, but He's not into waste. He doesn't pour into a cup that will not be poured out. So when David said, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over, God did that for a man who was going to pour out what had been poured into him. And indeed, David did, and he gave us the book of Psalms. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And one day, David will again sit upon the throne in Israel, as the Bible has promised. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so the anointing of the Holy Ghost is for a purpose. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me too. First, preach. Preach what? Good tidings. Good tidings. Or the New Testament says the gospel because the word gospel means good news. Now I want to give you a hint tonight. If your gospel has no good news in it, it's not the gospel. If you're standing on a street corner telling people they're going to burn in hell, I appreciate your boldness, but I don't appreciate your stupidity. That is not the gospel. Can you say amen? And just getting in fights with people on the side of the street. Amen. Hallelujah. I remember one time I was in Austin, Texas. And uh, if you didn't know, Austin is not like the rest of Texas. The rest of Texas is Bible Belt, you know. But Austin, the, the, the phrase for Austin is keep Austin weird. It's very liberal. And so I was in Austin, Texas, uh, there to win souls with, with other Bible school students. And we were by the University of Texas, the Longhorns. And... Um, While we were on campus, there was a man standing on the sidewalk with a big sign that says, repent, and he was yelling at everybody, telling them they were going to go to hell. And as I was walking that direction, there were two students, I knew they were students because, you know, they looked young and they had the, the Longhorn, you know, logo on their shirts. They both flipped them off. And so the guy leans into him and he yells it louder, you're going to burn in hell. So I wanted to prove something to myself. Stupidity doesn't work, but the gospel does. So I walk up to those two guys and I said, hey guys, real quick, has anyone ever told you that God loves you and that he has a plan for your life? They said, are you with that guy? I said, no, and neither is God.
Amen. Amen. Somebody says, you actually said that? Absolutely. And I was being nice. Amen. I wanted to show that guy the same finger, but I'm a Christian. Amen. They said, are you with that guy? I said, no, and neither is God. And they laughed. And I said, but in all seriousness, if you died today, would you know for sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that you'd go to heaven? They looked at each other. They said, no. I said, well, listen. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And right then and there, with that guy still yelling out of his bullhorn that people are going to burn in hell, those two guys that just flipped him off bowed their heads and gave their life to the Lord right there. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. I, prove, I had to prove it to myself that night. Because the Bible says in Acts chapter 28 and verse 28, preach the gospel to the Gentiles and they will hear it. Amen. Amen. Why does that matter? Because faith comes by. Amen. Amen. So the first function of the anointing is to preach the good news. Now, the King James Version here in Isaiah chapter 61 says meek. Other places it says the poor. Preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to bind up or to heal the brokenhearted. So the second function of the anointing is to heal. To preach, number one. To heal, number two. This is what you need to understand as a Christian. You may not be called to full-time ministry, like a pastor or an evangelist or a teacher, but every Christian is called to preach. Amen? And every Christian is called to heal. Every Christian is called to heal. Amen. Here's the thing about healing. Healing is not accidental. Healing is confrontational. So if you're going to see God heal people in and through your life, you have got to confront sickness and disease. Can you say amen? Amen. Now, primarily here in this passage, it says he has called us to heal the broken hearted. Amen. So yes, the anointing works for physical healing, but you need to know also that the anointing heals the broken heart. Now, as I was saying just a few moments ago, you, you might have thought I forgot about it, but I didn't. But as I was saying just a few moments ago, that when I first got to, to Bible school and I didn't know how to receive from the anointing, it seemed like that because nothing was happening to me outwardly, there was no manifestations happening outwardly, that I wasn't getting touched. But my pastor one Sunday said something that set me free. He said, in the atmosphere of the anointing, where the anointing is moving, even if nothing particularly happens to you, you need to understand the anointing is still working. When something happens to somebody on the outside, what that is is an overflow of what the anointing was doing on the inside. Amen. Amen. Now, if you're looking at a transparent bottle or cup, you can see where the water is in the cup, right? But if you're looking at a cup that isn't transparent, the only way you know the cup is full is when it overflows. Well, I don't know about any of you, but I don't have x-ray vision. So I can't see how full you are of the anointing. I can't see how full you are of the presence of God. But when you begin to overflow with the presence of God and it manifests on the outside, then I know you were filled, 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 filled to overflowing. Amen. So somebody says, well, pastor, uh, nothing happened to me last service. Doesn't mean God wasn't pouring. It just means we hadn't hit overflow yet. So you don't back off of the anointing. You come back into the presence of God again and let him keep pouring and let him keep pouring. Now, here's what here's what can happen is you can live your life with the presence of God filling you to the brim. And so the moment you step into a service, just one drop and you're spilling over. Can you say amen? And in fact, that's how God wants you to live. Hallelujah. Just so full of the presence of God, just so full of his power, of his anointing, that one drop and you're spilling over. Amen. 
Hallelujah. But remember, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me too. Say this, the anointing has a purpose. This is where many churches have missed it, is it's been all about presence and not about purpose. Even in Pentecostal churches, you got people shouting and screaming and running around the room, and they leave the four walls of the church, and they do nothing with it. Amen. And so it becomes a little bless me club. Well, what happens to a body of water? Shut up, Siri. What happens? It's always trying to interrupt me. Amen. What happens to a body of water that has no outlet? Turns into a swamp. Nothing can live in it. It's dead. Amen. Hallelujah. And so what God wants you to do is the power, the presence that he fills you with, he wants it to pour out of you. He wants it to pour out of you. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so... The point of Christian living is to be daily filled so that you can be daily poured. Amen. Daily filled so you can be daily poured. Daily filled so you can be daily poured. Paul put it like this in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He said, in a great house there are vessels of wood and of clay and of gold and of silver. And he said, if any man or woman be purged from the former, in other words, the wood and clay, he shall be a vessel of gold and silver. He will be set apart and prepared for the master's use. Now, how many know that you don't put out the fine china for just any old dinner? You put out the fine china for a special meal. Amen. What do you use for just dinner on a Tuesday night? The paper plates. Amen. Because it makes cleaning up easier. Hallelujah. And so in a lot of cases, a lot of Christians, they are used like vessels of wood and clay. They're used for common things because they've never set themselves apart to be beautified, to be purged by the anointing. But when you decide, not only do I want to be used for the common thing, but I want to be used in the uncommon thing. I want God to give me uncommon testimonies in my life. I want God to give me uncommon breakthroughs. I want God to use me in uncommon, unusual miracles like he did Paul. When you come to that decision in your life, there is a sanctification process that begins to take place where the Spirit of God begins to separate you from natural things. And the things of the world, they lose their grip on you because you've lost your interest in them. Paul said, if there's anything I'm going to boast in, it is this one thing, that the world has been crucified to me, and I have been crucified to this world. We are dead to one another. Can you say amen? amen. There was a great preacher by the name of Leonard Ravenhill who used to ask, is the world crucified to you tonight, or does it fascinate you? As somebody who grew up in a Christian home but allowed the things of the world to begin to fascinate him. And if it wasn't for the fire of God, I'd be lost in that world still. The cry of my heart for my son, the cry of my heart for my daughter is God, don't let the world fascinate them, not for one minute. Let my babies be sanctified in the presence of God for every moment they live upon this earth until the day you call them home. Let them never be fascinated with what this world has to offer. Because in comparison to the true riches of the anointing, it is slop. It is filth. It is unsatisfying. Hallelujah. And there are plenty of people in this room tonight who have been high on what this world has to offer. And they would testify that there's no high like the most high. And there are plenty of people in this room tonight who have been drunk on what this world has to offer and they would testify that there is no drink like the new wine of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. I mean, really all the devil can do is polish a turd and put a bow on it. 
Because that's all he has to offer. So I want to say this to you parents in here tonight. And I don't care how old your children are. I don't care how old you are. I want to say this to every parent in here tonight. You have to model sanctification to your children. And I promise you when they see it, they won't want what the world has to offer. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And listen, I, I got to tell you this too, parents. Your children do not want grumpy Christianity. They do not want depressed Christianity. They do not want screaming and yelling at each other on the way to church and then putting on a church face when you walk through the doors Christianity. They want the real thing. I know sometimes things happen. But they want, they want the real. They want the real. The reason, why I, <laughs> the reason why I didn't backslide more in my life is because nobody could convince me that God wasn't real. I felt his presence every day in my home because my mom was a praying mom. And not only was she a praying mom, it would have done no use for me if I heard her pray every day and never saw answered prayer. But I saw answered prayer on a continual basis. There was never a question for me. Amen. And even when I wasn't serving God like I should, I'd be at parties. And I'd be sitting there on the couch. By the way, all my, in, my, in high school, all my friends knew that I was a Christian. And they wouldn't let me drink or smoke anything. Somebody tried to offer me something. My friends would be like, no, knock it away. <laughs> they wouldn't let me do it. Amen. I had a friend named John Sanchez. He looked me in the eye, drunk as a skunk one night, and said, you're meant for more. <laughs> Amen. He was prophesying. I was meant for more. Amen. And so I was, <laughs> if my mom knew these were happening, she wouldn't have even let me gone, but you know. Sorry, mom. But I was, I was sitting on the couch one night at a party. And there was a, a kid, I don't know if he was high or drunk, but he was, he was something. <laughs> and he looked over at me and he said, he goes, man, what do you want to do with your life? I wasn't even serving God like I was supposed to. And I looked at him because I just knew. I knew since I was three years old. I just looked at him and said, I'm going to be a preacher. <laughs> he goes, bro, you're going to be a blanking awesome preacher. <laughs> I said, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so let me say this to you tonight, parents. The degree to which you sanctify your life now, your children won't start at square one. Your ceiling will be their floor. They pick up where you've left off. Amen. amen. You can ask my mom, I'm doing much better at 32 than she was. And Eliana and Gabriel will be doing better at 32 than I am. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let me say this to you tonight, parents. If you have any children that aren't serving God like you should, make the decision. Tonight, make the decision. I'm going to step over into the realm of the anointing to such a degree that it's going to be like a vacuum cleaner for my family. It's going to draw them into the kingdom of God. I'm going to keep winning souls till my family comes into the kingdom. Every day that the devil tries to hold my family, I'm going to make him pay for it. Amen. Can you say amen? I'm not just going to sit back and whine about the fact that my children aren't serving God. I'm going to win souls. I'm going to lay hands on the sick. I'm going to make the devil hurt till he lets him go. And then I'm going to make him hurt again forever, taking a hold of them in the first place. Can you say amen? amen. You don't have to be under attack. God has given you the power by the Holy Ghost to be on the attack. Amen. Can you say Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach and to heal. Say, to preach, preach. And, to heal. and to heal. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now, if we were to go to Luke chapter 4, it would word it this way. To declare liberty to the oppressed. 
Now here is the biblical definition for oppressed. The biblical definition of oppressed gives the picture of somebody who takes two steps forward and three steps back. They're caught in a cycle. Every time it seems like things get a little better, something inevitably happens that like a dog on a chain, it yanks them backwards. And so proclaiming liberty to the oppressed is Jesus literally loosing you from the chain the devil has. That when you make forward motion in the things of God, when you make progress, when you come to a place of promotion in your life, that the Spirit of God causes you to excel in that area. That there's actually an acceleration in your life. You don't see backward steps. You only see forward. Amen. How many in here have heard of a man of God by the name of Lester Sumrall? Lester Sumrall was a mighty man of God. And uh, you can find him on YouTube. Powerful ministry. I promise it will minister to you. But when Len Lester uh, and his wife, when they built their house, the Lord told Lester one morning, he woke him up very early in the morning, he said, I want you to make some changes to the architectural design of your house. He says, Lord, shouldn't you tell the architects? I'm not an architect, Lord. The Lord says, I'll show you. The Lord has him pull up the blueprints, and when he looks, the Lord highlights the garage. Now, why would God care about your garage? Why would it matter to him whatsoever? The Lord said to him, he said, I want you to put your garage out further into the driveway, and I wanted to have two doors on one side and on the other. Lester said, Lord, I'll do whatever you say, but why? The Lord said, when you pull into your garage one way, you exit the other way. Lester said, okay, Lord, but why? And the Lord said, I want it to be a sign that with me, you never have to go backwards. Amen. With me, you never have to go backwards. Lester Sumrall, uh, his ministry headquarters was in South Bend, Indiana. And one day, he was getting back from, uh, from doing some meetings in a different place. And when he lands in South Bend, his, his son Frank is waiting for him on, the, on the, the runway. Lester starts walking off the plane, and Frank walks up to him, and he says, Dad... The TV station burnt down. Lester looks up at Frank and without hesitation says, build another one, and turns back around and gets back on the plane and flies off to go preach somewhere. Now, I'd heard my pastor tell that story many times, but I heard Frank Summerall tell the story. Brother Frank said, yeah, all of that is true, but what you've never heard is that the same day my dad said that, he said, I went back to my office at the ministry headquarters and said, where are we going to get the money for a new TV studio? And at that moment, the ministry secretary brings the mail and drops a letter on Frank's desk. Frank opens the letter, and in it is a check for $2 million that at the time was enough money to build a new TV studio that was twice as big as the last one. Now, how many of you in the natural, if your TV studio burned down, that'd shake you just a little bit? Amen. Come on, you don't have to lie. This was <laughs> Amen. You get off the plane and find out that your TV studio burned down, that's not necessarily a good day. But Brother Sumrall had come to such a revelation, a revelation, such an understanding of the things of God, that he was not concerned whatsoever. And when Frank looked at the date of the check, the check was made out two days before the fire happened. The Lord had already made provision not only for there to be restoration, but for there to be acceleration before the fire even started. Can you say amen? That is somebody who has been liberated from oppression. Where Lester Summerall did not have to get up in front of any crowd and say, if, you, if the Lord would move on your heart, we'd ask you to please give an offering tonight so we could rebuild our TV studios. He got to get up in front of crowds and say, well, praise the Lord, we're bu building a TV studio twice as big as the last one. Can you say amen? amen? That is being liberated from oppression, and the anointing is what has the power to do that. 
you don't have to be stuck in any destructive cycle because as a child of the living God, the anointing that rests on your life breaks you free from every oppression. Can you say amen? So you don't have to. You make the decision. Whatever you bind on earth is. Whatever you loose on earth is. And those of you who come here regularly, you've heard me say it. We don't really talk like that today. Bind and, and loose. So what's another way we could word it? Whatever you permit will persist. Whatever you resist will retreat. Amen. You make the decision how long these things last. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, you know, I'm just believing God. Why don't you just do something about it? Amen. Instead of just sitting around. Can you say amen? amen? And you have to come to the place, you know what I'm about to say, where enough is enough. Bless God, I'm not moving backwards. I'm tired of being stuck in this cycle. I'm going to move forward. The last time I touched drugs is the last time I ever touched drugs in Jesus' name. The last time I touched the bottle is the last time I ever touched the bottle. The last time I got bad news about my children is the last time I'm ever getting bad news. The last car accident we ever got in is the last car accident we ever get in in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And the power of the anointing accomplishes these things. The power of the anointing accomplishes these things. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I want you to consider this. That really, before Jesus went to the cross, he suffered no difficulty in his life. Oh, there were things that came against him, but they couldn't touch him. Literally, they couldn't touch him. Now, this passage of scripture I'm reading to you, Jesus himself, the Bible tells us, stood up in the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he found the place where it was written, and he read this passage. And he closed the book after he quoted this passage. And he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And when he said that, the people in the synagogue were filled with rage. And the Bible says they wanted to throw him headlong off of the cliff whereupon their city was built. You know what that means, throw headlong? Anybody in here ever watch Fresh Prince of, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Remember what Uncle Phil used to do to jazz? Ah! <laughs> Tossed him out the house. That's what they wanted to do to Jesus. They wanted to throw him headlong off the hill whereupon their city was built. But the Bible says Jesus just passed through the midst of them and went his way. We don't even fully know what happened. How do you just walk through a crowd that wants to kill you? We don't know if the Lord froze them all in place. They couldn't move. Somehow Jesus became invisible for a second. Nobody could see him. We don't know what happened. He just passed through the midst of him. You don't just walk through a crowd that wants you to die. Especially back then when they used to kill people for fun. No consequences. You got to stone people all the time. Big stoners they were. Amen. You don't just walk through a crowd that wants to kill you. Listen. I heard of some guy that stood up at a theater one time. And when he left that theater, there was a crowd that wasn't too happy with him. I found out how hard it is to pass through the midst of them and go your way. Amen. But they couldn't touch him. And you read in the book of John, John chapter 8, John chapter 10, John chapter 12, again and again and again, they plot the death of Jesus, couldn't touch him. It wasn't until it was his time to go to the cross that that happened. And Jesus even said in John 10, 10, no man takes my life from me. I have the power to lay my life down and I have the power to pick it up again. They didn't kill Jesus. He laid his life down. Amen. Amen. He said, it is finished, and the Bible says he gave up the ghost. If he hadn't said that, he'd still be on that cross alive. Nobody could kill him. Amen. Amen. In fact, he could have come down any time he wanted. He laid his life down. 
As we already said, even when the temple guards came to arrest him, he told Peter, I could pray right now and my father would provide me with 12 legions of angels. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? And so as a, a believer, listen, you are a Christian. Do you know what that means? Little Christ. Just so you know, Christ was not his last name. It wasn't Joseph Christ, Mary Christ, Jesus Christ, and all the little Christs. In case you didn't know. Christ was the Greek way of saying Messiah. It means the anointed one. So we're talking about the anointing tonight. The anointed one. Amen. Amen. You are a Christian. Amen. In other words, you are a little anointed one. Amen. Now somebody says, well, but, you know, he's Jesus, and, you know, he had the spirit without measure. That's true. But the Bible also says in Ephesians 3.20, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly, above all you ask or think, according to the power that is at work, Where? So that's true, Jesus had the spirit without measure, but you haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the anointing that rests on your life. Amen. The power that is at work on the inside of you can do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? And Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also. And what? Greater, Greater works than these because I go to my Father. Can you say amen? amen? And I'll even prove to you that that happened. As mighty a miracle as Jesus had in every city that he went to, everywhere he went, the Bible says that he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. But as great as the miracles were in Jesus' life, we see in Peter's life a higher level. Because in Jerusalem, Peter would be walking down the street and they would lay the sick and the demonized on the side of the road so that just Peter's shadow passing upon them would heal them or set them free. Amen. 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 Am I saying Peter had more anointing than Jesus? No, I'm saying what Jesus said was true. That the works that I do shall you do also and greater works than these because I go to my Father. Can you say amen? amen. Somebody says, but yeah, pastor, the early church, they were in prison all the time until angels broke them out. How do we so conveniently forget that part? <laughs> well, but the early church was in poverty. Really? Acts chapter 4 says there was no need among them. That doesn't sound like poverty to me. There was not any need, not one need. Nobody was lacking anything among them. I'm not even sure that would be true for the group we have in here tonight. There's probably somebody in here with a need tonight. But the early church that was over 8,000 people, not a single one of them had a need. Come on. The early church was poverty. No, they weren't. They had more than enough. Can you say amen? Even Paul said in, in Philippians chapter 4, he said, I have received the gift which you have brought unto me by Epaphroditus. I have all and abound. You have brought to me more than enough, and it has gone before God as a sweet-smelling aroma. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Don't just let some religious deadhead tell you how things were in the Bible. Read it for yourself. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Bunch of religious devils. <laughs> Amen. No, notice the, listen, notice the two things that have come under fire the last two years. Healing and prosperity. Healing and prosperity. Why? Because the devil wants you sick and poor. Because if he can keep you sick, you won't get out of bed. And if he can keep you poor, you won't go anywhere. And we have even major ministers coming against the tithe because the tithe is the one covenant God has given to his people that causes us to excel beyond this world's level of prosperity. Amen. Because anybody, the, the, the seed time and harvest, that is an earthly principle. The Bible says, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest. So even unsaved people can operate in seed time and harvest. How many believe you reap what you sow? 
but the best a seed can produce is a hundredfold. Right? Biblically, 30, 60, 100-fold. But the tithe has no limitations. He'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so great there's not enough room to take it all in. That's more than a hundredfold, my friend. And so the enemies come against the tithe because he wants to stop the people of God from operating in their covenant. But all that tells me is the devil's afraid. I believe more people are grabbing a hold of the covenant of tithing than ever before. Hallelujah. More people are being lifted out of generational poverty than ever before. They're turning their whole family around. They're going to have things that their parents never had. They're going to walk in wealth their family never walked in. They're going to be a greater blessing to their generation than anyone in their family had ever been. Can you say amen? They're going to change the reputation of their last name. How many in here have heard of Evangelist Jonathan Shuttlesworth? He's a third generation preacher. His grandfather was the first in the family to get saved. And before his grandfather got saved, he was a, a miner in the coals in the coal mines of West Virginia. And if you heard the last name Shuttlesworth, even 60 years ago, the last, that last name carried the connotation of drunkards. All the Shuttlesworths were drinkers. And they all worked in the coal mines. But one day... They called him Mickey. A.E. Shuttlesworth was driving home from the mine and saw a cute girl walking into a tent and wanted to ask her out on a date. But when he parked his car and got out and walked under that tent, he found out what kind of tent it was. It was a gospel tent. Hallelujah. <laughs> Having Holy Ghost meetings. Well... A.E. sat in the back of that tent and thought to himself, I'm going to wait till the service is over and ask that girl out. Well, the service continues on, and at the end of the service, the preacher's up there, and he's giving altar calls. Now, back then, preachers did things that preachers today don't do. Even I won't do this. Back then, if the preachers knew there was a sinner in the service, he'd walk right up to him and say, are you going to give your life to the Lord tonight? <laughs> Amen. And I've wanted to do that, but I've never done it. Amen. And so A.E. Shuttlesworth said that the preacher locked eyes with him when he was given the altar call, and he thought to himself, if that preacher comes within arm's length of me, I'm knocking him out. And he said the preacher was walking closer and closer, the preacher was walking closer and closer, and all of a sudden, A.E. Shuttlesworth says he opens his eyes and he's on the floor. And he thought, did the preacher knock me out? <laughs> it wasn't the preacher, it was the Holy Ghost. And he came to on that sawdust floor, sat himself up, walked down that aisle, went up to the preacher, because the service was over at this point, and said, preacher, I want to give my life to the Lord. Surrendered his life to the Lord that night. And now when you hear the name Shuttlesworth, you don't think drunkard. Now when you hear Shuttlesworth, you think Holy Ghost preacher. <laughs> Hallelujah. A.E. Shuttlesworth had four boys, and every one of them were preachers, and every one of them have children, and every one of their children are preachers, and all the, the great-grandchildren, they're all heading to the ministry, hallelujah. Some of you were here last year when we had Preston Shuttlesworth, who's a third generation, amen. And he, I mean, he, psh. amen. Praise the Lord. That's the power of the anointing. Set at liberty those who are oppressed. Because A.E. Shuttlesworth said he had tried several times to break himself free from alcohol. And everybody would tell him, you're a Shuttlesworth. You're going to drink. But now that's not what you think when you hear, you hear Shuttlesworth. Yes. The anointing destroys the yoke of bondage. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? The anointing destroys the yoke of bondage. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to close with this tonight. Hallelujah. How many feel the presence of God in here? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, you might say, Pastor Michael, I keep hearing you say anointing, anointing, and what it does, and that's great, but, but what is it? The anointing is simply this. It is the presence of God manifested. Somebody says, well, but I thought God was 
omnipresent. I thought he was everywhere at once. He is, but he's not manifesting everywhere. In other words, his presence can't be sensed, his presence can't be experienced, his presence can't be felt everywhere. So the anointing is God's presence manifested. It's what we mean when you hear us say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. It's what we mean when we say, God, fill this place. It's what we mean when we say, entering into the presence of God. It's the anointing. It's the anointing. And when God has shown up, nothing is impossible. Come here, Daisy. Hallelujah. 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 Lift your hands. Now somebody says, why do people cry or laugh under the anointing? Because when the creator of the universe shows up, it's not going to be business as usual. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. Filled right now from the top of your head, that's it, to the soles of your feet. Let that go right through you. Let that go right through you. There you go. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. Come here, share why. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand right here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A little closer. A little closer. A little closer. Lift your hands. Touch. Right through you. Hallelujah. 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 Now somebody says, why is she laughing? The physical body only has so many responses to the presence of God. But you can laugh in two different services and God's doing two completely different things. Somebody says, well, every time they laugh, God's doing this. No, you don't know that. Amen. Hallelujah. Come here, Connell. Hallelujah. I saw it come on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Touch. Right through you. There it is. Right through you. Hallelujah. Now somebody says, why do they fall down? Because they can't stand up. Hallelujah. 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 Come here, Jacob. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A little closer. A little closer. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, it's not about laughing or falling down, because if it was, I could just put on a comedy, or I could just count to three, we all sing London Bridges, we all fall down, and we could go home. But it's about what happens when you get up off the floor. Come here, Marianne. Hallelujah. It's about what happens when you get off the floor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Stand right here. A little closer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I command that healing anointing to go right through your body from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. The last night you lost sleep is the last night you ever lose sleep. In Jesus' name. There it is. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. Right through you. There it goes. 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 Headaches go. Pain goes in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, somebody says, well, is acting like this necessary? Well, yes, and for one good reason. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17 that God offends the mind to reveal the heart. So he'll do things. God's not, see, God's not like the average American church where they're trying to entice people in. Actually, in the Gospels, one man said, Lord, let me follow you. And Jesus said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. 
That's not a great advertisement, is it? You're not going to sell too much of your product that way. Amen. Another man, Jesus said, follow me. The man said, let me bury my father first. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. That's not very nice. <laughs> Jesus, he just lost his dad. But Jesus said, no man putting to his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for my kingdom. Amen. There's a cost to the anointing. Come here, Isaiah. There's a cost to the anointing. Lift your hands. There's a cost to the anointing. But I'll tell you it's worth it. I'll tell you it's worth it. I'll tell you it's worth it. Whatever you lay down for the kingdom of God, you get back in spades, I promise. That's it. Let that go right through you. Hallelujah. 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 Now, as I said, the anointing's in here right now, so it's doing a work. It's doing a work. It's doing a work. It's doing a work. Hallelujah. And as I said, it's not about falling down. And whether you fall down or not means nothing to me. I don't feel more anointed if you fall down. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. There it is. The attack against your life stops now. Stops now. You'll look again and you won't even find those people. And you know who I'm talking about. The Lord says, vengeance is mine, I'll take care of it. Hallelujah. So rejoice. <laughs> rejoice. <laughs> rejoice. <laughs> Weeping indoors for a night. <laughs> but joy. <laughs> but joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> there it is, right through you. Right through you. <laughs> Let that go right through you. Pill. Pill. No, that's it. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> right through you. There you go. There you go. And somebody says, why did, you do, why did you blow on them like that? The Bible says Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. And I have no other reason except that. Come right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, come here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand right here. Hallelujah. That's it. That's it. Let the fire of God go right through you. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost go right through you. Never the same. There it is. That's it. Filled in Jesus' name. There it is. Right through you. Right through you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I break every yoke right now. I break every yoke right now. I break. There it is. Ha. 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 Don't cover your mouth. That's what the devil wants to do. The devil wants to shut you up. Ha. Ha. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Come here, Michaela. Hallelujah. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Hallelujah. 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 Lift your hands. As you do, the fire of God comes on you. There it is from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Fire in Jesus' name. <laughs> yeah. God says, I've anointed you to prove people wrong. Yeah. So don't worry about if people don't like it. Hallelujah. And you'll prove them wrong with more than just your words. You'll prove them wrong by your life. So the people who doubt, your life will be a contradiction. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's going to create enemies. But no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Now, when I said that, her mom and dad started cracking up laughing. Because she's been proving people wrong since she could talk. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what the fire of God does? Fire of God makes you you. Amen. See, if you really have the fire, you won't be a copy. You won't be a copy. I came out from under Rodney Howard Brown, but if you watch him, you watch me, we're different. There might be some similarities. We have people laugh. That don't mean anything. The fire of God makes you you. Amen. Hallelujah. Fire of God will make you an anointed mother. It'll make you an anointed father. It'll make you an anointed baker. It'll make you an anointed candlestick maker. <laughs> she makes candles. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> if you didn't know. I believe they're $18 a piece. <laughs> 25 for a set. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Mr. Alex, lift your hands right where you're at, sir. You don't need to come up. Just lift your hands. The Lord says, I'm preparing the way for you to do exactly what you're supposed to do with your family. And when the moment comes for you to minister to them, they won't see you as Alex. They'll see you as a man of God. And I'll back you up with the anointing. So don't be dismayed or discouraged and don't try to water it down. Not that you ever would. But the Lord says, I'm with you. Hallelujah. So rejoice and be glad. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now somebody says, Pastor, in the, old, in the Old Testament, prophets would show up and they had bad news. How come you always have good news? Well, when Jesus showed up on the scenes, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me too. And one of the things he said is, Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So in the Old Testament, oftentimes prophets showed up with bad news. But in, the, in this new covenant, we don't have bad news that often. Because we're walking in the year of the Lord's favor. And when he said year, he doesn't mean 365 days. He just means an age or a period of time. We're in the age of the Lord's favor. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? That doesn't mean God won't have you repent. But the Bible says it's his goodness that leads us to repentance. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Mr. Mark, step right here. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Stand right here. Lift your hands. And the Lord wants you to know every one of your grandchildren are going to serve him. Every one of your grandchildren are going to serve him. Some will be called to the ministry. Some will be called to business. But the fire of God will burn in every one of them. And the day will come, and you'll live to see it, where you'll be sat at a table with your grandchildren and each of them talking about the presence and the fire of God. And you'll think it's a dream. The Lord says, I'm going to bring it to pass. The Lord says, don't, 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 don't. Be condemned about mistakes you've made. Where he says, I'm redeeming the time. Walk with me. I'm redeeming the time. Jesus. There it is. There it is. Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Let that go right through you. Hallelujah. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know what? Somebody says, what's that called when you say those things to those people? The Bible calls it prophecy. Amen. The Bible calls it prophecy. Amen. 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 Somebody says, well, I wish he'd say something to me. <laughs> well, if the Lord gives me something, I will. 
But I promise you right in your seat tonight, God's saying something. Amen. 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 Whew. <laughs> now here's something cool about the anointing. I, yeah, I feel it too. Here's something cool about the anointing. You notice it feels hotter? Yeah. Even though the air is on? It's the fire of God. Here's something cool about the anointing. The Bible says, he that waters shall himself be watered. Yes. You ever noticed any time you go to water your lawn, your hose gets wet? Yes. And so as I'm ministering the anointing to people, I'm getting touched myself right now. Yes. I'm getting ministered to myself. Yes. I got to hold it together. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. What's happening? Feels jo you feel joy? You feel happy? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You look happy. You're a little cross-eyed, but you look happy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You'll notice too, I mean, tonight I got a little excited, but if you notice, I wasn't just screaming into the microphone all night. Just because somebody's loud doesn't mean they're anointed. Amen. A lot of times they're just a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. That's one thing I learned from, from my pastor. There's some services he doesn't even say anything power of God just sweeps over the place. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Now you're not, you might not be used to laughing in church. But it's better than having a church so dead it looks like we're having God's funeral. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's what happens too. People don't even realize in atmospheres like this, people are getting set free from demonic oppression. Amen. Amen. Because when the light turns on, the rats and the cockroaches run. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I heard a man tell a testimony last night. He was watching, uh, he was watching my pastor. And this was, he, this was three years ago he saw this, but it was a video from the 90s. So over 20 years ago. He was watching my pastor... And my pastor laid hands on a man and said, fire. Now, this man's watching this video on his phone on YouTube. He was seeing my pastor say fire to a man from the 90s. But he's watching this happen in 2019. And when he hears my pastor say fire, this man on the video screams. And when the man screams, this man said something leapt off of him. And he started weeping uncontrollably. Amen. This man had been doing cocaine and marijuana for over 20 years. And he was a convict. He'd been to prison for many years. He said he could count on one hand the number, at that point in time, he could count on one hand the number of times he cried. But he said when he felt that thing leave him, he started weeping uncontrollably. And so he went to the bathroom to try to fix himself up, and he, he quickly runs to the bathroom and shuts the door. And when he did, his daughter knocks on the door. Dad? So he goes, tries to suck it up, you know. He goes, yeah, what is it, baby? She said, something just happened. He said, what? She said, the dog was barking for no reason. So I went out, I went out in the hallway to see what it was, and she said there was a dark figure, and it went out the window. 
Now get this, no one prayed for this man. He watched my pastor pray for somebody on a video that happened 20 years earlier, more than 20 years. That's how powerful the presence of God is. That thing saw the anointing and wanted nothing to do with it and left that man. Long story short, he's now in the ministry. In three years, God turned him into a preacher. And the first place God sent him is to the prison that he was in for so many years and led all of his inmates to the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? And so in atmospheres like this, things are just lifting off of people. Amen. It's not always demons. Sometimes it's strongholds, but whatever it is, it has no business in your life. Amen. The Bible says, for freedom's sake, God has set you free. Yes, thank you, Lord. In other words, God sets you free simply because he wants you free. He hates seeing his people in bondage. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Well, that's my introduction to the anointing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want every head bowed and every eye closed tonight. Thank you, Jesus. I don't normally do this on a Wednesday, but I feel led to tonight. Hallelujah. If you're in this place and you have never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to know, my friend, that today is the day of salvation. Jesus Christ, the Holy One of God, the Anointed One, the Son of God, He came down to the earth in the flesh and He lived a sinless life. But He died on a sinner's cross and He did it for one reason and one reason only, so that you and I would never have to go to a devil's hell. The good news of the gospel is not that you're going to hell. The good news of the gospel is you don't have to. Jesus paid the price. The blood has been shed. The justice of God has been satisfied. And all you have to do is put your faith in Jesus. And the Bible says if you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. So tonight I want to ask you, has there ever been a time in your life where you have publicly repented of sin and confessed Jesus as Lord? Listen, I'm not asking have you ever been to church before. I'm not asking have you ever prayed before. I'm asking, have you ever surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus? If the answer is no, I want you to know tonight is your night, and Jesus is calling you. Even while I'm speaking right now, your heart's beginning to beat. What is that? That's your spirit telling you that it's you. The Lord's calling you tonight. You can lay your head on your pillow tonight and know you have peace with God. Not only that, but the Lord will break the power of sin off your life. He'll break the power of shame. He'll break the power of guilt. He'll break the power of addiction. Everything the devil's tried to bind you with, he'll break it off of you tonight by the blood of Jesus. And you'll never be the same again. Maybe you're here tonight and at one time you did surrender your life to the Lord Jesus, but if you were honest, you're not living for him right now like you should. If Jesus came back tonight, if the trumpet sounded tonight and the Lord Jesus descended from heaven into the clouds and called his faithful up to him, you're not sure if you would be among that number or if you would be left. And the reason you're not sure is because you're not serving him like you should. You've allowed the things of the world to come in. You've lost your first love. You've lost your joy. You've lost your peace. Something happened that's knocked you off course. But tonight you say, I want to surrender to the Lord again. I want to come back into fellowship with him again. I want to serve him with the fire of the Holy Ghost once again. If that's you, I want you to know the Lord is not mad at you. He's calling you back to himself tonight. He's inviting you back into fellowship with him, back into his presence again. And all it takes is a yes. All it takes is a yes. Maybe you're in here tonight and you serve the Lord with all your heart, but the devil's always lying to you and telling you you're not saved. 
He's told you you've done too much wrong, that God can't save somebody like you. You're too wretched. You're too dirty. I want you to know that's a lie from the pit of hell. There is nothing you've done that the blood of Jesus cannot wash you free from. And tonight, you and I will pray together, and you can know that you know that you're a child of God. So if you're here tonight and you fit into any one of those three categories, number one, you've never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus and tonight you feel him calling you, or number two, you once did but now you're not serving him like you should and you want to rededicate your life to him, or number three, you serve God with all your heart but the devil's always lying to you telling you you're not saved and tonight you want to be sure that your home is in heaven. If you fit in any one of those three categories, I want to pray with you and for you. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to do something very bold but very simple. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come to this altar, this stage where I am. You and I are going to pray together. Don't worry about anybody else because no one else in this room is going to stand with you on judgment day when you stand before a holy God. If you'll stand for him now, he'll receive you to himself on that day. Today's the day. Right now is your moment. On the count of three, make that bold but simple decision. Come to this altar. On the count of three, if you know that's you. One, don't wait, don't hesitate. Tonight's your night. Two, get ready. Get ready. Three, get up out of your seat. Come to this altar right now. You and I are going to pray. Come on, come on, come on, come on. That's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. That's it, that's it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah, the Lord's calling you tonight. Hallelujah, the Lord's calling you tonight. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, just come stand right here in front of me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. <laughs> come on, if you know that's you, don't turn him down. If he's calling you, I don't care if you've been going to this church since day one. If God's dealing with you tonight, it's not about anyone else but what God's doing. Hallelujah. If you're brand new, we welcome you. It, it don't matter. I just want people to go to heaven. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to give it one more moment. <laughs> I'm going to give it one more moment. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want you all to look up at me. Praise the Lord. I want you to know two important things. Number one, you've not come to man. You're not coming to me. You've come to Jesus. Now, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draw him. So the fact that you're up here tonight is proof that God drew you. And number two, he said, whoever comes to me, I will not cast you out. He's not schizophrenic. He's not going to call you to himself and then reject you. That's how we know when we pray this prayer right now that not only does he hear you, but he's been waiting for you to pray this prayer. And after this prayer, listen, you are one prayer away from everything turning around right now. Amen. Now, normally I'd have you pray for yourself, but I want to make sure we hit all the high points. So I'm going to say a prayer. I want you to repeat after me, but I want you to say it with all your heart and watch what God does in your life from this day forward. Lift your hands to heaven. That's where your help comes from. Let me get the help of the congregation. Say this with all your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, come to you I come to you in the precious name, the precious name of, your Jesus. of your Son, Jesus. Lord, Lord you said in your word, said in your word I, must believe I must believe with my heart, with my heart and, confess and confess with my mouth, with my mouth and, I and I would be saved. So, Father, so Father I believe. I believe and confess, and confess. Jesus, Christ Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Is the Son of God. He, came in the flesh. he came in the flesh. He lived a sinless life. He, lived a sinless life. he, shed, all he shed all of his blood. And he died on a cross, on a cross. For, me. for me. And one day soon, one day he's, soon. Coming he's coming back for me. Because today, because I, surrender my life I surrender my life to him. To him. Father, Father, forgive me, forgive me. of my sin. Wash me, Wash me. Cleanse, me. cleanse me, set me free. Set me free. Let, me Let me never be the same again. Tonight, Tonight. I turn my back on the world. I turn my back on sin, I turn my back on sin. 
and I follow you, and I follow you. Lord, Jesus. Lord Jesus. Today, Today I'm, born again. I'm born again. I'm forgiven. I'm, forgiven. I'm, saved. I'm saved. And I'm on my way to heaven, and I'm on my way to heaven. because I have Jesus, I have Jesus. In, my heart. in my heart. Amen. 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 Come on, give the Lord praise tonight. Give the Lord praise. Come on, you can do better than that. Hallelujah. 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 Now let me, pray. let me pray this prayer. Just lift your hands one more time. Now, Father, seal them by your blood and by your spirit that on that day not one of them would be missing but would be welcomed into your kingdom hearing well done, not medium rare, but well done, <laughs> good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And right now, I break that condemnation off of your mind. Enough is enough. You are a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. The past is over. The past, there it is, the past, the past, the past is over. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Jesus, there it is. <laughs> Let that go right there. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Never the same. Never the same. Never the same. <laughs> Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A new level. <laughs> A new level. Jesus. There it is. A new level. New. New, new. A new, new, a new level. Hallelujah. 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 Look at me. Do you believe in God for a new job? Um, I've, um, I'm actually, um, I'm working right now, but, um, um, I just applied for my, for my, for my own business. Okay. Business, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Tell something similar to that. Lift your hands. It's yours in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, cause it to prosper. Everything she puts her hand to, there it is. Cause it, there it is, to prosper in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lift your hands, my friend. Hallelujah. Oh, that's the presence of God coming on you. <laughs> Never the same. Never the same. Father, raise him up. Use him in a mighty way. Let him lead his family as a man of God. Let him lead them in the way they should go. Bless them and prosper them, Father. Show them, Lord, that with you there's no limitation. There's no ceiling. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. The past is over. The past is over. Tonight. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus, 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 <laughs> Jesus. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Hallelujah. 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 Now, religion would tell you with all this laughing and falling down that it would scare people away. The power of God actually draws people in. Amen. It actually draws people in. The biggest altar calls I've ever seen is after Holy Ghost meetings where the power of God sweeps over the place. Amen. Hallelujah. People don't want fake. They want the real. Amen. I don't know about you, I can't stand fake. That's why I love my wife. She's real. Amen. Amen. That's why I love my mom. She's real. I mean, she would really just... You know. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Were you blessed tonight? Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to give you an opportunity to give. 
If you're here at the altar, don't hurry. Don't rush to get up. We're going to give you an opportunity to give tonight. That's why I wanted was water. <laughs> Ushers are coming down the way with offering envelopes. Ask the Lord what have you to give. I'll tell you, in atmospheres like this, your seed is supercharged. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The Bible says in atmospheres like this that God commands the blessing. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you need a pen, we have pens. If you need tissue, we have tissue. Hallelujah. Yes, if you'd like to give online, the, the information is behind me on the screen. You can give by PayPal. PayPal.me slash truth, the letter N, triumph. You can give by Zelle. 951-536-1803. You can give by Venmo, at truth, the letter N, triumph, at truth, N, triumph, all one word. You can give by Cash App at dollar sign, truth, the letter N, triumph, all one word, dollar sign, truth, and triumph. You can give by text at 628-444-4136. Text the word give and the number of the amount you'd like to give. You'll receive a text back with a link. Tap that link into your card information. And we promise it's secure giving. You can hit the Remember Me button on the bottom so the next time you give, you don't have to enter inf your information again. It'll automatically, uh, automatically give. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You can make your checks out to Truth and Triumph. Amen. Hallelujah. Don't make them out to me because my wife will get all the money. <laughs> Amen. Also, I'd go to jail, so, you know. <laughs> and hell. Don't want either of those things, so. <laughs> Don't make them out to me. Amen. Hallelujah. Man, I missed Wednesdays. I hadn't preached a Wednesday in a while. Hallelujah. How many of you like Pastor James more than me? You better not raise your hand. <laughs> You're fired back there. You're fired. I saw Sarah raise her hand back there. <laughs> I was stretching. I was stretching, Pastor. No, if you liked him more than me, I get it. He's amazing. <laughs> I think I like him more than me, too. Hallelujah. How many enjoyed Brother Mark last Wednesday? Amen. 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 He did a great job. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm thankful God's bringing in people here at the church that have an anointing to minister. Amen. It's not all about me. In fact, very little of it is about me. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. We want to raise people up. Thank you, Jesus. Quick announcement right before I give tonight. Just a reminder, session four of School of the Bible starts this coming Monday, August 1st. Amen? Amen. School of the Bible, session four. We're teaching on pneumatology. Pneuma is the Greek word for spirit. Tology means study. So the study of spirits, we're going to be talking about the human spirit, the Holy Spirit, angels, demons, and Satan, and why he's a big loser. Amen. <laughs> and not really worth worrying about. Praise the Lord. And uh, it's going to be a great time. Uh, if you'd like to sign up for that, um, the application form, which by the way, we accept everybody, but the application form is on the, uh, the church website, truth, the letter N, triumph.com, truth and triumph.com. You can go on there and register. It is uh, just to cover the cost of doing it and because we pay, try to pay Michaela for helping us because she comes over and helps us. 
Uh, the cost for the individual is $50 at $75 for a couple. Amen. Of course, you could pay for an individual and two of you watch, and I'd have no idea. But that'd be between you and God. Amen. Hallelujah. I'll say this. If you can't pay right away, come talk to me. We'll work something out. Amen. I just want to get this information over to people. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then this Sunday is our back to school outreach. Amen. Do we have more invitations? Okay. We have uh, invitations. Listen, this Sunday is our back to school outreach. We're going to be giving away over 100 free backpacks to school age kids. We want to bring in as many people as possible. We're going to preach the gospel. For those of you who have been with us for previous outreaches, this one's going to function a little differently than before. The children are going to be in their own classrooms this time, and we'll have the adult service in here. But in all three services, both classrooms and in the adult service, uh, we're still going to be preaching the gospel and seeing people saved. Amen. We're going to be giving away things in the adult service too, so mom and dad can get blessed. Hallelujah. Amen. And I'll tell you, we are, like I said, we're doing our, our outreach a little different this year, but uh, what has permitted us to do that is our harvesters who have been going out regularly and winning souls and bringing people into the kingdom of God. In the month of July, we've had over 500 people call on the name of the Lord. Amen. In that, one, in that one month alone, that's more souls than we saw the entire first year of our ministry. Amen. Come on, you can't beat that. Amen. You can't beat, amen. amen. That's called acceleration, where you do more in a month than you used to do in a year. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. And it's all about souls. It's all about souls. I don't care about anything else. Amen. amen. The only thing you can take with you to heaven is people. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. Don't do it with a weapon, please. Do it, do it with the gospel. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what's this Sunday? Back, back to school outreach. And what happens this coming Monday? Amen. So if you haven't signed up yet, please do that now, okay? Yes, pastor. Y'all ready to give tonight? Yes. Father... <laughs> <laughs> Sherry was with us on the youth trip. She got used to saying yes, Pastor. Fa Fa Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for both the gift and the giver tonight. We thank you, Father, that what is given will be returned back to them multiplied. Because your word promises, Father, that you not only give seed to the sower, but you also give bread for eating. Then you multiply back in harvest the seed sown, and the harvest we get, you said you increase the fruits of our righteousness. We get a greater harvest than others. And your word declares that you enrich us in everything, in everything, so that our generosity will increase. And the increase of our generosity results in greater thanksgiving being brought to you. And that's the desire of our heart, Father, that every area of our life would be in glory and gratitude and thanksgiving to you. In Jesus' name. And so, Father, we give with joy and expectancy tonight. Let there be an expedited harvest on the seed sown tonight on the behalf of every person who could have been doing anything else on a Wednesday night but chose to come into the house of God. Bless them, Father, in everything they put their hand to, that the remaining days of this week would be the greatest second half of a week they've ever had. In Jesus' name until we gather together on Sunday to worship you for all the things you've done. And we thank you, Lord, for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give and as you go. I love you. Oh, hold on. Okay, volunteers, I need you here. 825, I'm saying 825 because we're going to have a meeting the real quick meeting that we do, be done by 8.40, and then we'll put you in your positions. Also, we're setting up. So 8.30 a.m., okay, 8.25 a.m., we're having the meeting, 8.30 a.m., Sunday morning, and then we'll put you in po your positions for the outreach. 
Saturday night, the night before, 5 o'clock here, if you're able to make it, we're doing setup for the outreach. So we have a whole bunch of stuff that we have to get set up. And what did you say? We need help. Yes, that's why I'm announcing it. So if you're able to make it Friday, Saturday night, 5 o'clock here, we're doing setup. And then everybody volunteering, I need to see you all here, 8.25 a.m. Sunday morning. We're starting the meeting at 8.30 and putting you all in your positions. Thank you. I love you. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'll sing you out. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are.